A woman was walking with her four-year-old son following Wednesday night Bible study. They were talking, and the, the son at one point just stopped. He looked up at his mom, and he said, Mom, I, I'm not going to sin anymore. Mother found that an interesting statement, so she stopped and asked, Son, why did you say that? The son told her this. He said, Jesus said that if you don't sin, you can throw the first stone. And I want to throw the first stone. Must have been an interesting Bible class that night, wouldn't you think? These are interesting times. Uh, society, it seems, has adopted this mentality. Um, I know nothing about the subject, but I'm happy to give you my expert opinion. Boy, don't we just see that a lot today? People that seemingly just really, let's, let's be honest, don't know much or anything at all about the subject, but all of a sudden they're experts. Now that can be football, basketball, or baseball. It can be politics. It can be medicine. It might be um, law. Uh, we have food critics that have emerged as experts. This group can even determine guilt or innocence based on the headline of a story. You have noticed my tongue-in-cheek, right? These are interesting times. Now, there is another mentality that has emerged in our society, um, that not just limited to social media by any aspect at all, uh, but it's the sorry-not-sorry sorry mentality. That's where I may do something wrong, but... Don't expect me to apologize. If I do, it might sound something like this. Well, I'm sorry that you took it that way. Now, you can call that what you want, but in my world and in my book, that is nothing close to a confession of wrong. I don't consider that anything close to an apology. Last week, we looked in Luke chapter 18, and as you have heard me say, last Sunday morning, this past Wednesday night, and then today, we're talking about the topic of prayer. Last Sunday morning, we talked about the parable of the persistent widow. When Jesus told that parable, He told His disciples why He was telling it. Jesus then told His disciples a parable, Luke chapter 18, verse 1, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Always pray and not give up. This morning, we just continue our way through Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, as we look at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, let's read that together, and then we can go and, and, and talk about it better. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. This is an amazing story. Here's what we have. Jesus described an unrighteous man as the one who was right with God. And the seemingly righteous man as the one who was not right with God. It's the opposite of everything that religious believers, uh, religious leaders believed. It's the opposite of everything that religious leaders must have taught. What we have is a self-confessed wicked man who left that temple area right with God. And then we have a man who, who self-proclaimed himself to be righteous 
who left that temple area not right with God. I'm pretty sure that the religious elite couldn't believe what they heard, but it is exactly what Jesus said. Again, Jesus wanted this group to hear this teaching. Jesus again gives us insight of why He's telling this parable. I'll remind you again of verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. So He is talking to people that are are self-proclaimed, self-confessed righteous people. Whether that's true or not is what they're claiming. To people who are looking down on everyone. What you have is, you have in Jesus' day, you have these self-proclaimed experts. They're experts in everything. And they're good at it. They look down on everyone else. This is that group that we talked about just a short time ago. Uh, Righteousness uh, becomes a centerpiece of this parable. How can I be right with God? Wow, that is a, that's an important question. And it really is asked uh, throughout the Bible. I just want to give us a sample of some times where that idea, where it comes up, where the question is asked. Because there's some important stories when you think about this and you look beyond that. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, we looked at this story a few weeks back, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. It began with an occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, What must I do to be right with God so that I may inherit eternal life? It's the same question that the rich young ruler asked in Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then chapter 16 in the book of Acts, verse 30 This is the Philippian jailer where he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Uh, One more. This is Job chapter 9, verse 2. Uh, We looked at this story this past Sunday night. Uh, Job says, "In, In truth, I know that this is so, but how can a man be in the right before God? How can a man be in the right before God? Now that's from the New American Standard. The New King James puts it this way. How can a man be righteous before God? How can a man be righteous before God? If you would like to see us have that type of conversation today, all you have to do is walk down the street and just ask someone, what must you do to be saved? Or you could ask it this way, how do you get to heaven? What we will find interesting is the spectrum of answers that are given. But really what we need to be doing is to look at Scripture. What does the Bible tell us? What does the Bible tell us? What does the Lord have to say? I'm not interested in some, in some self-proclaimed expert in, in religion, whether or not they read the Bible or not. They're going to tell you what they think. What I'm interested in, what does the Bible have to say? You know, we we grew up, or at least I did, with this mentality. Could you show me a book, chapter, and verse? I think that is still a a really important thing. So here's the problem. Here's why this is a difficult question uh, from a biblical standpoint. Uh, The book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, boy, be holy because I am holy. That is a statement that is found throughout the book of Leviticus. The the theme of that is how it is be holy... For I am holy. Be holy because I am holy. That's the goal. The problem is, is that, well, it, it's worded very well in Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, uh, where Scripture tells us there, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. So what we have is this call to be righteous, to be holy. But the reality is, is that sin separates us from God. We need to be right with God, but we can't be right with God because of sin. And there we go. What I have said multiple times, 
mankind's greatest problem is sin. It's our greatest problem because there's not anything we can do to fix it. Well, what is the question? Or the question, actually, that part's clear. What's the answer? What is the, if sin is mankind's greatest problem, what is the answer? What it takes to Romans chapter 3, it's verses 22 through 24. Today I want to read this from the New Living Translation because I think this is really, uh, sometimes I need it to be simple. I need it to be where I can understand it. And I think they do a wonderful job of making this so clear and understandable for us. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone is sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. What's Paul talking about? He's pointing us to Jesus. Sin is mankind's greatest problem. But through the blood of Jesus, the debt of our sins is paid. Our sins are forgiven. We're declared righteous. Now, how do we come in contact with that saving blood of Jesus? Keep reading in the book of Romans. You see, this is where we cannot stop by just reading one verse. You have to keep going. And if you get to Romans chapter 6, Paul's going to tell us that. He says that we're baptized into Christ. We die to sin. We're buried with Christ in baptism. And we're raised to walk a new life. Sin is our greatest problem, but Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Again, it's that that age-old question. How can a man be righteous before God? So we hear that, the call to holiness, but sin has separated us from God. That's our greatest problem is sin. And Jesus has paid the price for that. So you may look at it, well, Johnny, why why aren't our church buildings full? Why aren't people running in to, to plead, to beg, please share the gospel with me? That's a really big question, and I wish I was wise enough to give you a complete answer but I can tell you at least one part, a very important part of the answer. We will never make the decision. People will never make the decision to follow Jesus until we first see the need for Jesus in our lives. Until we recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, We won't run to Jesus. Until we know that no man comes to the Father except through Him. Well, it's not until that point that we're going to run to Jesus with everything we have. By the way, that's John chapter 14, verse 6. So until we recognize that we sin, we fall short of His glory, and Jesus is the only way, the only way, Truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Until we recognize it. Now see, that takes the whole idea of self-proclaimed experts and it throws it out the door because what we want to know is what does the Bible tell us about Jesus? What does the Bible tell us about the gospel message? All right, now I, I, I needed to tell you that. I know you may think, Johnny, we got a little off, a little off course there. No, we didn't, because I needed us to hear this part about righteousness, and I needed us to hear that it comes through Jesus. Because what we're about to see in this parable is this man that he declares himself to be righteous. He's not, but he thinks he is. He has convinced himself that he is. And that, my friends, is a dangerous place to be. So let's go back to the parable now. I think this helps us. Uh, Jesus says that two uh, men went up to the temple to pray. 
There were two times a day when sacrifices were offered. Crowds gathered at the temple. It's nine in the morning, three in the afternoon. Very likely one of those times. There are a lot of commentators that think probably the afternoon time because it was a bigger crowd and the Pharisees kind of liked the bigger crowds. All right, you can do with that what you like. But we know this, that it wasn't just going to be the two of them that were there. Jesus is telling this as a parable, all right? He points to two men. First of all, he points to the Pharisee. Now, the New International Version puts verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. This is a difficult verse, and it is a difficult verse to translate. Let me give you an example. The NIV says, stood by himself and prayed. The New American Standard says, was praying thus to himself. The New King James says, prayed thus with himself. Now we can do with that what we want to, of whether he, he was off separated from himself, that doesn't surprise us because he's a Pharisee and he would want to separate himself from the others because he's looking down his nose at it. So we, we, we see that. He was praying. Was he praying to himself, with himself? I, I know this, that it was a very self-absorbed prayer. It was more of an, an announcement, a proclamation. Remember Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, uh, that the, they, they love to, to pray where others can hear what they're praying, how good they are. Uh, I want you to look at this. Just look at the emphasis, the word I. How many times the word I? It's a short prayer as Jesus tells the story. But, but look at the emphasis on that prayer. This is from the New American Standard, verses 11 and 12. God, I thank Thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Let's see. One, two, uh, three, four. Wow, wow. Five. Four. Five. One, two, three, four, five. Five times the letter I, the, the, the word I. This guy was self-absorbed. Look at what he said. He starts off by saying, I am not immoral. So what he did is something that, again, I think a lot of us have a tendency to do. If we're going to compare ourselves to somebody, we always look to find somebody that we don't think is as good as we are. Whether that is in a sport, whether that's in a subject, doesn't matter, whatever the topic may be. So this religious leader, he says, I am not, I'm not like the swindlers. I'm not like those people that are unjust. I'm sure not like those adulterers. Oh, I'm not like him either, as he thinks about the tax collector. So he talks about the fact, he says, I am not an immoral person, but I am a religious person. And it's there that he lists these two items. He says, I fast twice a week. Now, according to the Old Testament law, Jews were required to fast one time of year. That was the Day of Atonement. There are other examples in Scripture where individuals or uh, communities, even nations, fasted uh, because of a crisis or because of sin, uh, whatever the case may be. So there are other examples. But what you have in this religious leader, somebody that just went over the top, Man, he is not going to fast once a year. He's not going to just fast occasionally. He is fasting twice a week. And I can just almost guarantee this. He fasted on the two days where he would have opportunity to see the most people. Johnny, why do you say that? I say that because of Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. You can go back and read that. Those are the words of Jesus where he talked about that, that these religious leaders, they like to, to fast so that they might be seen by men. So he said, I, I fast twice a week, but also I give a tenth of all that I have. I give a tenth of all that I get. When you and I think about that, and I'm not telling you that we're right, but I, I think about the fact that, okay, uh, I would give a tenth of, of what I made. If I'm back then, I give a tenth of what I made. If I've sold some property or sold something of value, I'd give a tenth of it. Uh, 
But boy, these religious leaders went far and beyond that. You can go to Matthew chapter 23 to get a good example of that, where Jesus lists off these, uh, these spices. Now, it would be very small containers, but it, when they're given a tenth, these religious leaders, they go through and they give a tenth of everything. So what he's saying is, is, is accurate. What he's saying is accurate. Now here's the question. Does it make him righteous? Does it make him right with God? Because he's not immoral and because he does these good religious things, does that make him right with God? What we find out is that there's something a lot more important than telling God how good we are. Let's go ahead and and let's look at the other part of the parable. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee had separated himself from others in all likelihood because he looked down on them. The tax collector, he he separated, stood at a distance. Why? Because he didn't feel worthy. He didn't feel like he was good enough. The religious leader looked up to heaven, which, by the way, is an acceptable posture of prayer. The tax collector would not even lift his head. Why is that? Because he was convicted of the sin in his life. In fact, he just beats his chest and he pleads with mercy. He says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He pleaded with God. He pleaded with God because of the sin in his life. He knew who he was. And so he's taking that before the Lord. He saw the need for God in his life. Do you remember I I, I raised the point of a little while ago of, of what would it take to have people running into church buildings running to say, man, please share with me the gospel to see the need for God in our lives. And the tax collector saw that. He's begging for forgiveness. So what is the big difference? What's the big difference? Because Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, verse 14, He says, I tell you that this man, talking about the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves, what did the Pharisee do? For all who exalt themselves will be humbled. What did the tax collector do? All who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus declared that the tax collector went home justified. Now, how do those sins go away when we were looking at that today in context of the gospel? Through the blood of Jesus. Take you back to Romans chapter 3. Through the blood of Jesus. Let me share this as we prepare to leave today. Don't feel sorry for the tax collector. No. He was sin-stained and he knew it. But he declared his unworthiness before the Lord. God have mercy on me, a sinner. If we're going to feel sorry for anybody in the story, our our hearts need to ache because of that religious leader, that Pharisee. Because he thought that he was good. He thought he he was not immoral. He's doing good things, so he thinks that everything's right. But the problem is is that the life he lived, did, did you notice what he never did in his prayer? He never asked the Lord for mercy or forgiveness or for help. He said, I'm doing fine all by myself. And that's the person who doesn't see the need for God in his life. And that's the person, if our hearts are going to ache for someone, that's who we need to ache for. So as we leave today, I I hope that you will stop and and, and give thought to mankind's greatest problem. It's sin. Also recognize that the answer to mankind's greatest problem is Jesus. Jesus who died on the cross 
so that our sins might be washed away. And so we, we come to the Lord and we are sin-stained. But when we died ourselves and we died to sin, we're buried with Christ in baptism, we are raised to walk a new life. The blood of Jesus washes us clean of our sin and God looks at us through the blood of Jesus justified, just as if I had not sinned. Are you a Christian? If not, I hope that you will, will run to Scripture, run to get in contact with, with us if you live in our area, or you can reach out to us. We will do our very best to help you wherever you may be to find out the story of the gospel and of how the blood of Jesus can wash us free of our sin. It may be that you are a Christian, but you need to make some things right with the Lord. I hope again that you'll reach out to us. You may be looking for a church home. If you live in our area, we would love for you to visit us at Monroe Church of Christ. We'd love for you to, to worship with us, to work alongside us, as together we strive to share the gospel in this area. May God bless us as we take this message and take it to heart.